Welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads, a podcast all about beer from a West Virginia perspective. I'm Aaron McCoy, here with my podcast partner, Charles Bakwe. Today, West Virginia Beer Roads takes a short trip out of West Virginia, across the Ohio River, and onto the college town of Athens, Ohio. I'm here with our co-host, Aaron McCoy. Aaron, I think visiting over here is something we both enjoy. Oh yeah, definitely. I, you, you have that correct. Today's trip is a fun one. And for those of you in the know, Athens, Ohio is a longtime home of the Jackie O's Brewery, which is definitely one of America's very best brewers. And it's a bright shining star among breweries in our Appalachian region. Yes, sirree. I so agree. Uh, West Virginians have gotten a lot more familiar with Jackie O's since they began distributing in our state during the past year. So it's time to hear from Jackie O's about their experience in West Virginia and in our market and get an update on all things new at the brewery. That's right. Joining us today is Seth Morton, who manages and coordinates all of the brewing operations at Jackie O's Brewery, including here at the production brewery where we are today and at the brew pubs in Uptown Athens and newly in Columbus, Ohio. So Seth, welcome to West Virginia Beer Roads. Hey, thanks for having me. Been looking forward to this. We are looking forward to this as well, and I understand that you've got a beer that we're going to sample as we work through this podcast, so yeah. can you talk about that song? Yeah, we've got a couple fun ones today. Uh, so the beer that we're starting off with is a West Coast IPA called Shop Dog. Uh, shop every dog. good shop has a good shop dog, and this beer was named after our mechanic, Benji Bright's Chihuahua June Dog, who oh. passed, a- passed away this year. She was oh, the best to ever do it. I love Chihuahua. Uh, but every brewery needs a good shop dog, and okay. every beer needs a pretty solid West Coast IPA, too. All right. um, really fun beer from the jump. This is part of, when we get into talking about Columbus later, we're doing a lot of one-off beers mm-hmm. out, of, out of this plant now, which we haven't done in a long time. We've been playing the hits for a while. We get to have some fun with, uh, with barrel-aged beer and mixed fermentation beer, but a lot of our ale program is, uh, is pretty tight and rigid and regimented. But now with the need for a lot more draft beer, we're, we're getting to play nice. a lot more down here. Well, let's just take a second, uh, Seth, and let's pour this beer and then come back and talk about it. Okay, Seth, we all have the beer in our glass. Uh, let's hear what we're drinking. So here we've got Shop Dog. Uh, this is a one-off draft IPA. Uh, sort of going a little more older school West Coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, This beer has got a a lovely amber color to it, whereas if you look at our flagship West Coast IPA, Mystic Mama, it's bright, bright blonde. Mm -hmm. Uh, I never thought that I would be intentionally putting caramel malt in an IPA for the rest (laughs) of my career. Uh, But here we are. We're we're playing with IPA here these days. Well, it's a good thing to play with. I mean, that's still America's favorite beer style. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so Shop Dog, um, talk to me a little bit about the hops that are in this beer and the ABV. Yeah, this is a fun one. We wanted to create a West Coast IPA that was distinct from Mystic, but it's kind of difficult to make a West Coast IPA without Citra, Simcoe, and Centennial in it. Uh, so we dug back into some offerings from our hop distributors. So this has Amarillo, Centennial, Chinook, and a little bit of Strata, which brings a little bit of a, a new edge vibe to yeah, it. It's very good, and it's clocking in at... I think about 7-1. Nice, and nice. And when do you expect it to hit the market? Uh, this is not getting packaged until this Friday. Oh, talk uh, about so fresh. So coming right up, guys. <laughs> coming, pulled this straight off the tank. Will it be yeah. in all your, all your tap rooms, probably? Uh, yes, It'll be at all the Athens locations as well as Jackie O's on 4th. Great. All right. What about Distro? It will be seeing a little bit of Ohio distribution through Cavalier Distributing, uh, but a a pretty small run on this one. Mm -hmm. But a cool opportunity to play. All right. Well, you guys have sure been busy here at Jackie O's. And as many of our listeners may know, you recently opened a tap room in the big city of Columbus. Um, how's that working out for you? It's been working out really, really well. Uh, Columbus is a very large market for us. If you look at major metropolitan areas, Columbus is our biggest market by far and long. Mm-hmm. Uh, COVID was really hard on destination breweries, sure. and I think we're thoroughly one of those. Uh, so if it's tough to get people to come to you, you go to them. And targeting a major metropolitan area is something that we've been looking at for yeah. a long time. Our owner, Ardo Strikes, from Cleveland. We had talked Cleveland for a long time. But... Uh, Columbus is also significantly closer, 
Uh, so easier to manage a brewery that's not a couple hundred miles away. Yeah, and I think maybe people in Columbus, a lot of them knew you, or a lot yeah. of people have traveled here to Athens, not that far away, and um, I think it's a good move probably. And how how's it started af- after a few weeks of being open? It's we've been we've been moving a lot of beer. It's uh, <laughs> already very much changed the way that we produce here beer at the uh, produce beer here at the production brewery. Most of what we produce here is stuff that goes into uh, distribution. So grocery stores, convenience stores. Mm -hmm. So we weren't producing a lot of draft only rips out of here. Right. All of our like one offs or draft only rips were coming out of the pub. However, when a need for a lot of liquid came very, very quickly. Now for the last five weeks in a row, we've been producing a 40 barrel batch of one off beer for draft out of this plant. Wow. Which it feels like it's 2013 again. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So Which is exciting. Uh, we're from shooting your standpoint. stuff off the hip. Yeah. And uh, actually, we just brewed a, a pale ale that our lead brewer, Chris Robinstraw, wrote the recipe for, the beer called Alumna. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a farmhouse pale ale down there called Cutter Bar. We've got Shop Dog. We've got uh, yeah. Sun which Shimmer, is which is a mango hazy IPA that we, that we just dropped. And it feels fun. There's a, a lot of creative energy flowing through this plant right now. That's great. And, um, Beyond Columbus Tap Room, which is certainly something you guys have been working on for several years, I know, uh, major accomplishment. Talk some, if you would, about some of the other accomplishments you think here at, uh, at the brewery that you're glad to see you finished and, and they're in place now. Oh, that's a good one, Charles. Yeah. We've, uh, we've honed in our, our canning machine over the last couple of years. We've been getting up to speed with our PS Angeles canning machine that now at full rip can go 100 cans per minute. Whoa. That's a lot of beer. That is, yeah. yeah. That's... And if something goes wrong, the dominoes start falling very quickly. Oh, uh, yeah. Imagine there's uh, some major training on that. Yeah. <laughs> we brought in a, a new six-pack holder. Uh, so we ran PacTech for a very long time. Uh, PacTech is more or less the, the gold standard in mm-hmm. what holds a craft six-pack together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, we found a product called E6PR, mm-hmm. which is a compostable six-pack holder. Yeah, I noticed that change, yeah. actually. Made from a post-consumer material. And while Pactec does do a very, very good job, uh, we found potentially a more sustainable option. Sustainability is a core tenet of what we do. So we've got the E6PR machine up and running, and we've just been... Holding down the fort. So we're in the middle of June now. The uh, Jackie O's on 4th opened on May 5th of this year. Mm-hmm. So it was hold, 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 okay, go. Yeah. And now we're, we're brewing like crazy. And it feels good. Yeah, I imagine you're consumed now with really trying to get your brewing sped up, speed it up or sped up, whichever that is. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> I mean, to try to get to make sure you have enough beer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's fun. I talk with our, uh, our GM at our on 4th location, John Clift, and I say, hey, what holes are in the portfolio? Yeah. If it's an ale, I can have it on your desk in three weeks. Yeah, which I imagine is a little bit of a, a, a timing, you know, challenge as far as your job goes. But, you know, speaking of your job, I know you've been here a while, Seth. So let, let's get into how many years have you actually worked here at Jackie O's? Well, I just realized, yeah, yesterday was June 19th. So yesterday is 12 years oh, that, wow. I, that I've been with the company. Years. Yeah. Congratulations. Happy, happy Thank anna- you very much. Yeah. Happy anniversary. Yeah, that's yeah. impressive. I mean, that's fantastic. And, you know, to all of the changes that you've been able to come through with this brewery has been pretty cool. It's, um, it's been a wild ride to be a part of. Oh, no doubt. Grateful but for it. I, I'm specifically curious, like, what is your background prior to Jackie O's? Oh, sure. Uh, so... When I landed in Athens in 2008, I started studying mechanical engineering. Okay. Uh, so I graduated with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Ohio University in 2013. I had started working for Jack Yeo's in June of 2011 after a recommendation from the founder of a nonprofit that I was working for at the time. Uh, I met Art in the brew pub at 7 o'clock on <laughs> June 19th, 2011. Not, not specific at all no, for our no. listeners. <laughs> I, I still remember it like it's, like it's yesterday. No, uh, it's, it's crazy. It was great. 12 years ago. But I told Art, you know, my background. Uh, did some construction and agriculture stuff growing up. Sure. And then was in uh, the mechanical engineering program at the time. And I told him what I had done and what I was capable of. And he said, when can you start? I said, I'll start right now. gave you a chance right away. That's amazing. And he said, great, we've got to load these chairs out of my out of this office and put them <laughs> in my truck and take them to a storage unit. And I started that evening. That's awesome. Yeah. And you've been here for the last 12 years ever since that moment. The water's warm. I'm not getting out of the That's pool. nice to yeah. hear. 
Well, you know, I, obviously you've you've brewed so many different beers with, since you've been here in 12 years. I can't even imagine. I, maybe you have that number, but without that number, are there any br- beers in particular that you like? You really enjoy brewing. I could, I could talk about Dark App for probably the length of this entire podcast. Okay. Um, oh Dark App is the, the beer that I think I'm the most emotionally connected with mm-hmm. at Jackio's. It was the first beer that I ever helped out with mm-hmm. brewing. Mm-hmm. Brad's assistant, Bradford Clark, uh, formerly of Jackio's, currently of Private Press Brewing out in Santa Cruz. Uh, Brad was brewing at the brew pub, and his assistant was out of town, and one of my jobs was to go up and help him mash in Dark App. Uh, which, which had to be was already becoming one of my, yeah, my favorite fun. beers. Yeah. And uh, I'm helping Brad mash in Dark App. And he says, okay, put on these neoprene gloves because we have to hold the mash in the mash tun <laughs> because it had brimmed the mash tun <laughs> completely. And I said, this guy's nuts. This is what I want to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're like, hell yeah. I was home brewing a little Sign bit back up. then. Brad was kind <laughs> enough to give me five gallons a second runnings, which I, quote, borrowed a aluminum stock pot from the kitchen. <laughs> uh, he gave me the second runnings in a bucket and some hops and some yeast, and nice. I took him back to my college apartment, parked that stock pot on my electric stove, turned it up to full rip, and stood there for five hours watching it not <laughs> five boil. Five solid hours. Eventually, <laughs> I, I dumped the hops in, cooled the wort, and that was the best batch of homebrew I ever made. That's awesome. <laughs> and then uh, on top of that, that was the first Imperial Stout that we ever brewed at this facility. It was the first Imperial Stout that I ever solo brewed. Uh, we've put well, it in, well, so obviously it holds a special yeah, place in your we've heart. Put Why it wouldn't in it? Almost a dozen different types of barrels. Yeah. We've adjuncted it every which way from Sunday. It's it's something that's a, a core tenet of my experience here at Jackio's. Well, that's amazing. Um, but in addition, like to follow up on that question, what is something that you just really enjoy drinking versus brewing? Oh, sure. Stylistically, these days we've had a lot of fun producing continental European pilsners. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've gone clean and crisp. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're, they're equal parts challenging and rewarding. Uh, but we've been able to increase our lager production out of this plant. And if you know about lager, that's a low and slow fermentation mm-hmm. where this plant primarily produces ales where mm-hmm. you've got a relatively quick turn time. Mm-hmm. So you gotta have some space for that. Yeah. 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 Um, we, we make room when we need to. Yeah. Um, but drinking and producing continental European lager beer has been really fun over the last couple of years. Well, guys, let's move on a little bit and talk about the new beers we can look forward to from Jackie O's this summer. Um, we've had this wonderful West Coast IPA, but... Uh, what's Shop a cu- dog. Yeah, what's a couple of the other uh, beers on, that will be on tap soon around uh, your Ohio market and other markets? Yeah, so a lot of the stuff we're, we're brewing, it's just going to be in-house, so you'll have to come to any of our locations to try them, the draft-only stuff that I was talking about a little bit ago. We've got this really cool uh, dry hopped farmhouse pale ale called Cutter Bar that'll be coming out soon. That features Ohio grown and malted wheat, oats, and triticale. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, that was malted by my good buddy Andrew Martahus up at House Malts in Cleveland. Yeah, House Malts. They're a nice operation, and I know quite a few Ohio breweries love to use their malts. Yeah, they're the best. So I know there's other things happening in Athens this summer, especially Ohio Brew Week. Happens every year, and it's coming right up. Uh, are you guys involved with that again this year? Oh, every year. Ohio Brew Week is, is so great. It's uh, We have breweries from all over Ohio descend on Athens, and some of them just walk right in the back door sometimes. <laughs> I miss when we, had a, when we had a basketball hoop down here. We'd sit out back and drink <laughs> short fills and play basketball all night. But tons of, tons of great events. Coming up with Brew Week, uh, I think it's ohiobrewweek.com, or if you Google Ohio Brew Week, right. you'll be able to find their whole calendar of events. Yeah, and we'll put a link to the Ohio Brew Week website on our website here with this podcast. Yeah, and yeah, and you've got to have special beers for that, of course. Yeah, uh, yeah. we've got a, a couple new releases that'll be coming out that week that we can't quite talk about yet. Sure, sure. Um, but there'll be cool stuff at the pub. There's a couple great events at the pub. There's a private uh, barrel-aged beer tasting event with me here. And nice. then the, uh, the Ohio Brew Week Top Deck Dinner, which I do with my good buddy, Andrew Rios Winmoth. He's the executive chef at Cutler's, which is the restaurant at the OUN. Uh, he and I collaborate on this dinner every year, and we have it on the, uh, the top deck of the parking garage. Oh, that's got to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so Jackie O's is definitely known for having a diverse portfolio of beer and beer styles. So can you talk to us a little bit and give us a little breakdown of the major categories of beer that you produce and roughly the percentages of what your annual production that those particular beers represent? Oh, sure. Last I checked, 
2022, we produced about 12,000 barrels of beer out of this plant, down a little bit from pre, you know, pre-pandemic numbers. But right, we're, right. we're climbing back at that through some creative efforts, like Jackie O's on 4th. We're slinging a lot of IPA, and I, I'd be surprised to find a brewery <laughs> of this size that's doing much different than that. I mean, outside of Allagash, mm-hmm. but they're perfect. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mystic, Mystic Mama and Who Cooks for You are, are flying the flag. Yeah. Uh, alongside the rest of our core portfolio, Chomalangma, and our rotating fruited wheat series now. Yes. So uh, that UPC rotates through the year between Raz Wheat, which is a raspberry wheat beer, Kind of Fuzzy, which is our peat and apricot wheat beer, and then Off Duty Lifeguard, which is yes. mango passion fruit guava. All right. Well, let's talk about what's been one beer that maybe surprised you recently with its market magnetism, like one that did better way better maybe than you expected that it might uh it was when we first started putting pilsner out in the market uh because we've been producing continental pilsner up at the pub but had started putting some of it in cans down here and the 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 market reaction from that was Mm -hmm. really really surprising yeah people were ready for it I, i yeah i think we're finding that people want to get back to sort of some some core or flagship styles that were old, maybe old school, Pilsner yeah. being one of them. Or maybe it's it's brewers saying, hey, this is what you will be drinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I had had a can of, uh, been out for a while, but I think it was your Czech Pils. Uh, Would that have been Speed Shop or Uptown Pils? I forget which it was, but I had some at home somehow. I must have had a can of it. Light green can? Dark green can? Probably lighter. Yeah, so that must have been Speed Shop. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Anyway, it was good beer. Yeah. Good beer. And we're going to take just... A quick break here uh, while we take another beer that uh, Seth brought for us, and we're going to try that one, and we'll come back and talk about it. So everybody get a, a, a oh, sniff yeah. and a, mm, boy. oh, boy. Oh, wow. yeah. Wow. Whew. Yeah. Ah, can't hardly talk. Phenomenal. <laughs> oh, that smells phenomenal. Okay. All right, we're back with our second beer and before we start talking about uh oh i don't know some consumer trends and things that you're seeing here at the brewery let's uh seth would you introduce this beer number two yeah so this one this is another beer that has not been packaged yet also served out of a anchor hawking mason jar (laughs) uh this is double barrel temple of minerva so this is uh an imperial stout recipe that i wrote a couple years ago and uh, we released the first vintage of Temple and Minerva at the 2022 Jackie O's anniversary extravaganza. Oh, wonderful. People seem to be pretty receptive on this. So we brewed another batch. But the other thing is the cycle time on Temple of Minerva is about 22 months in barrel. So <laughs> takes a minute. Patience rewards. Uh, on the second vintage, we knew that we wanted to, to play with it a little bit. We'll also soon be releasing uh, straight up bourbon barrel Temple of Minerva. But we got four very special barrels that we selected for double barrel Temple of Minerva. Oh, wow. Um, Well, so you said when you started the description for this beer that that you wrote this recipe a a while ago. So what was your inspiration for this recipe in particular? Um, So in 2019, our former director of brewing operations, Brad Clark, left to start Private Press Brewing out in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. So... Off of that, we continued brewing what I call our our heritage brands, Mm -hmm. but I wanted to design a recipe to defeat all of them. Now, that's that's a bit (laughs) of a stretch, right? Um, I mean, this is pretty amazing. Thank you. uh, (laughs) I haven't had the previous. uh, And written a a ton of recipes for the barrel aging program, but wanted to create a, a new flagship brand for this brewery and our barrel aging program. So it's been about six months writing the Temple of Minerva recipe. Got it brewed. It was in barrels for 22 months. Then that came out whenever it came out. And then brewed another batch. And then now we're starting to riff on this brand. Ah. So Temple of Minerva is going to be uh, a, a small batch brand that we'll be producing annually. And again, in, in small quantities, but something really special. So it's turned out well, but your, but your first batch you were happy with? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it took 22 it months it to, came around, to come around. Yeah, but, which uh, it had to be a, But oof. barrel aging is about patience. Yeah, yeah, a horrific wait, but paid well, off. Well, I think you nailed it on this one. Thank you, Charles. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. It's very good. Well, Seth, we've seen a bunch of significant consumer trends uh, in beer 
over the past decades. I wonder if you could uh, discuss a bit more any long-term and short-term trends that you're currently seeing in the beer markets and the you know, like beer style preferences and things, um, maybe what's growing, what's declining. Sure. I think maybe, maybe it's my optimism is that people may be uh, circling back to traditional styles. Mm -hmm. We've, like I said earlier, we've seen some success with the lager program. We've been doing some traditional English style beers and uh, surprisingly getting back to doing some traditional Belgian style beers oh, yeah. in our portfolio. And maybe that's just wishful thinking and no. us wanting to... No, I like that. We're, we're, <laughs> Please do that. I don't want to say that we're entirely <laughs> IPA'd out at this point, but uh, where, where we're trying to lead people back to, and a lot of breweries are also doing this, is lead people back to traditional styles. Yes. Right. We, we definitely have products where the product is the conversation, maybe something like Double Barrel Temple, but oh, yeah. getting back to a place where beer is part of the conversation and mm -hmm. not the whole conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you see some trends like coming faster, lasting shorter times, I mean, in, in the myriad of beer styles that are out there today? I mean, as far as their popularity, what people ask for? That's a, that's a fantastic question. Uh, IPA is still king. Mm -hmm. IPA is still doing great. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the folks that are seeing growth are, are lucky. But surprisingly, I don't really pay too much attention to those metrics. I keep my ear to the ground yeah. on what other people are doing. But with the advent of on Jackie was on fourth, I've just really been keeping my ear to the ground on what's been successful up there. Sure. Right. Which has been which has been surprising. Fruit. Fruited beer is doing very, very well up there. I was just at a brewery in uh, Charleston the other day that uh, was telling me their fruited sours are their most popular beers, mm -hmm. you know, even outselling their IPAs. For, I believe that. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's just great. It's some of them are just, uh, you know, they're maybe not quite like yours because a lot of your sours here are barrel aged and traditional more. Yeah. Uh, here we, we only do traditional mixed fermentation right. mm -hmm. sour yeah. beers. Um, and those have been going gangbusters as of late. Uh, we lean onto fruit in those because fruit helps move those products. Mm -hmm. I call mm -hmm. it the uh, the chili's fajita effect, <laughs> where you see a, a pour of a vibrant red raspberry mixed fermentation beer from across the room, and it's just like those fajitas coming sizzling out of the kitchen. You go, I don't know what that is, but I want. But that. I want that. They're yeah, they're very fair. vibrant, very uh, physically striking beers in their appearance. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's been great. Over the last couple months, we've seen a, a lot of attention paid to our mixed fermentation beers with the advent of Jackie O's on 4th, and now we're making mixed fermentation beer as fast as we can, Yeah, which is something also haven't been able to say in quite some time. Yeah, yeah, well, hey. Um, so, what, so Jackie O's entered the West Virginia beer market last year, which I couldn't be more excited about, and definitely sent you a message and was like, yes, but having said that, how would you say that it's going for Jackie O's? West Virginia is going really, really well. It's, it's something that we looked very closely at for a very long time. Mm -hmm. West Virginia, uh, while there are absolutely fantastic craft breweries in West Virginia in a larger distribution sense, mm -hmm. possibly an underserved market. Mm -hmm. uh, Definitely. So, I mean, since we've moved into West Virginia, it quickly became our largest distro market outside of Ohio. Wow, no kidding. In three months. And wow, yeah. so quickly. That's yeah. impressive. Um, do you, do you, are you able to say what exactly what style or, or preference you feel like is like the most well-received? Uh, sure, it runs Virginia, really or? parallel to the brands that are successful in Ohio. Okay, so it is similar. Well, because again, we're only 30 miles from so, West uh, Virginia wow, where we're course, sitting, Of course, of right? course, yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, yeah, but I was just thinking, like, Columbus is a little farther away, but still, we're drinking the same kinds of beers yeah, that, yeah. that yeah. people in Columbus are. Yeah, yeah. but three months, that's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah. But if you're listening in West Virginia, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I will. Uh, Heck but yeah. uh, brand wise, it, it runs pretty much parallel to what's been successful in Ohio. Okay. IPA does well, fruited wheat does well. We've sent uh, some drops of our barrel aged product down there mm -hmm. which accounts that bring those on are few and far between and that's that's anywhere sure but well, because the abv generally with that type of a beer yeah and, style. and cost too I, and you know it takes a certain type it takes the right account to to onboard a product like i that, would imagine you yeah. know 
Well, so, you know, having said that, it, you kind of pretty much, I think, answered what I was curious about next about brands that West Virginians might be able to look forward to this summer. Maybe are you going to kind of mirror the Ohio market or are there special brands or maybe something that West Virginians specifically can look forward to this summer? Sure. As of right now, uh, our West Virginia distribution portfolio is going to vary closely. Well, it's going to exactly parallel what's <laughs> what's going into our Ohio, our Ohio distribution portfolio. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, the big hook brand that we have in our limited release series right now is a uh, hazy IPA called Endless Echoes. Yeah. Uh, Citra, Eldorado, and Idaho 7, which nice. is just, that's like cheating uh, <laughs> in regard to hop combos. <laughs> But uh, Endless Echoes will be making its way down to West Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, around the holidays, we do a holiday beer called Deck the Hills. Oh, nice. May or may not make it down to Mountain State Beverage, our distributor in West mm -hmm. Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's that's something that's that's always ongoing because you... committing committing to a certain level of volume, the domino effect rolls backwards, right? Sure, sure, So sure. sourcing the cans, sourcing raw materials. Sure. Um, are, are, are you all planning any, any events specifically in West Virginia? Yes. After we come up from air, co sorry, come up for air from uh, opening Jackie O's on 4th, which is still happening. Very, yeah, very yeah, live. This, yeah. this weekend we're doing our first big release yeah. at, the, uh, at the Columbus location. Mm -hmm. So once we come up for air, we're going to start digging into doing uh, even more special events that's in West Virginia fantastic. than we've already done. We, I know our local beer club, but that's the, the Craze Club out of Charleston, West Virginia. Um, it, there's some very uh, loyal followers and, and many other craft beer followers. We, we will very much look forward to that. Can't wait to see it advertised. Yeah, right on. When you make as many different beer styles as Jackie O's does... Seth, what would you say are your biggest challenges in managing the beer production? Oh, it's like trying to use a Ouija board in an earthquake. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, can, I really can only imagine. Um, luckily, we have a very uh, talented sales director in Kevin Caulfield who watches all the metrics of what's going where and what's doing well very closely. Mm -hmm. So he and I talk multiple times a week. We're steps away from his office right now. But... Luckily, we have an extremely talented team that's hyper-focused on what they're responsible for. So it's it's keeping your ear to the ground, but also trying to stay as nimble as you can. And so you have people, too, who manage your supplies, the ordering the supplies, the grains, the hops, and all the other things, the cans, everything you need? There were some kind of wonky supply chain issues rolling through, like, oh, late yeah. 21 into yeah. 22. Sure. Um, the thing is, is we're not, 12,000 barrels sounds like a lot of beer, but in regard to a brewery that's distributing, we're kind of small. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's kind of a, a Goldilocks situation mm -hmm. where we're small enough to do small brewery stuff, but big enough to do big brewery mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is great. And yeah. How many employees now roughly here at uh, the production facility in Athens and all? Uh, it depends on what, what departments you include. Mm-hmm. But I would say no more than 20. Mm -hmm. However, I was just on our HR software and total employees were north of 170 at this point. Yeah. And so you guys have to not only brew well what you already brew, but you have to sort of have a crystal ball too and predict the future a little bit and think about what's coming up down the road. How does that happen here? I mean, which people are more involved in those kind of decisions? Well, my crystal ball's been in the shop since March of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure mine's broken beyond repair, uh, yeah, so I feel you. Yeah, so it's, uh, now we're not just, you know, throwing darts at the wall. Uh, on top of reacting to what products in the market do well, it's also up to us to see to try to figure out what products are going to do well in the future yeah. sure, and then bet the farm on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you have to plan everything. Yeah. And you made a decision, you know, a year or so back to, to get into the West Virginia market. Uh, are there any other new markets coming or how do you make that decision about entering a whole new market? I mean, it was probably you beating down our door for about five years, Charles. <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> yeah. That was part of it. But no, we, hey, we, we a saw a too. very underserved and local market. Uh, sustainability is a, a huge part of our business. So sure. yeah. So the close. The proximity to West Virginia, yeah. burning less diesel, yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and yep. getting product where people want product. Now, that right. being said, we distribute beer globally, and 
the decisions as to where we decide to distribute beer next is just listening and going out there and seeing it. We've seen great success in Georgia and North Carolina. I mean, we're Japan, surprisingly. Oh. Wow, really? Yeah, uh, a lot of the EU. Uh, so and now we're talking about a lot of that being our specialty projects, sure, model sure, products, sure. like sure. very like high value yeah. products. When you make beer that's fifteen ninety nine for a twelve point seven ounce bottle, yeah, yeah, but you've got to spread that count. You've got to spread that pretty thin. Well, when right. we're talking shipping and like yeah. internationally, that's got to be. But the I'd say about eighty nine percent of the product that we make is uh, sold in the state of Ohio. Yeah, that's with sure, West sure. Virginia yeah. being a, a very lovely and close neighbor. Yeah, yeah, and I'm sure that uh, this brewery. Uh, Jackie O's, meaning all your operations, between everything you make, you're one of the more, I guess, wider breweries and beer styles in price range. You know, you have yeah. regular price beers all the way up to fifteen ninety nine for a, a, a small bottle. We've we've got a product for hopefully for every consumer. We've got a, a beer called Ricky, which is our Amer- American Golden Ale. <laughs> yeah, we love is, it. <laughs> Insert price based on location for a 14 or 16 ounce pour here, but uh, a, 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 an affordable product all the way up to very high end barrel aged beers. But it's this is a, a trope that's been beat into the ground. But we make stuff that we want to make. Well, as you should. Um, it's your brewery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, my name isn't on anything. The but, the, <laughs> the debt and the deeds belong to yeah. Art Ostrich. Well, well uh, but yeah, just, but you know, you've been here long enough. Um, Clearly, they appreciate your, your brewery style. The, yeah. That he's given me the corner of the sandbox that I get to occupy. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one thing that that we as West Virginians definitely love is your beer can art. Yeah. And not only because and wait it, a minute, it's not Art Ostrich; it's the Beer can art. On the, yeah. We love, yeah, yes. We love that. Are we talking about art or are we yeah. talking about art? We, we definitely yeah. love art, but we also love the beer can art. Yeah, yeah. Um, we love it not only because it looks so amazing, but a lot of it is designed by a West Virginia-based artist, Bryn Parrott. Um, so what can you tell me about that relationship? Are you still sticking mostly to ap- animals of Appalachia on the labels and, and with her can art? Or are you branching out? Yeah. Bren's been doing our can art work since 2013, since the first cans that yeah, came so out. Yeah, so 10 years for her. That's amazing. Yeah, Firefly and Choma Lungma were the first yeah. two canned beers we put out of this plant with Mystic hot on its heels. Bren has always done fantastic work for us. She's always been so cool to work with yeah. and to, to you know, just I say. I love her labels. It's a box turtle with a tiki drink on its back. <laughs> <laughs> Go. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But Bren always comes back with She's, such great stuff. Yeah, diverse. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, and and we look forward to it. Like specific, like specifically, Charles would admit this, but I will. We we discuss the animals and oh hey, did you see that porcupine or did you see you know whatever's on the label? We we very much appreciate that and enjoy that. Yeah, we're so. we're flying the flag of Appalachia to the best of our ability. Yeah, yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Seth. I've been to a number of your Jackie O's Imperial Scouts programs since it started a few years back, and I've enjoyed being a part of that program. Could you maybe uh, take a few minutes here and explain the program, the Imperial Scout program, to our listeners and maybe talk just briefly about how people can get involved in it? Yeah, so if you're interested in joining the Imperial Scouts program, uh, you can navigate that through our website. I forget what drop down it's on. But the Jackie O's Imperial Scout is sort of our reserve society. So there's a limited number of members. We do have some openings. Uh, we'll have some openings going into 2024. Mm-hmm. 2023 is already closed. But with that, you get three bottles each included with the membership price. You get three bottles each of six different releases throughout the year. Now, our barrel aging program, we've got about 500 individual bourbon barrels sitting over at the over at the barrel warehouse. And our minimum run on a bottling run of barrel aged beer, say our annual run of Dark Apparition, can be upwards of 40 individual barrels going into there. Wow. It's with a stuff lot. for scouts, yeah, with yeah. stuff for scouts are we're looking for four barrels to go into that blend. 
where a lot of times when we're blending, we blend to brand. It has to taste like dark app. It has to oh. taste like oh, yeah. Dark yeah. Ma- black maple. It has to taste like oil of Aphrodite. Yeah. But oh, yeah. with the blends that we do for scouts, I mean, these are beers that essentially don't exist. We're doing maybe a, a hundred cases on a run. So that's where myself and the rest of the blending team get to go in there. We don't have to play within stylistic guidelines. What we're doing when we blend beers for scouts is honestly blending beer for the beer's sake. Mm -hmm. So listening to what the barrels have to say and then building a blend from that. And it's, it's great. We've got a a very active Facebook group Mm -hmm. uh, where members have direct access to me and the rest of the team. We Mm -hmm. do some media stuff for that. We do a, a tasting video for each of the releases Scouts get the first crack at all of our releases. And a, a cool thing is, is if you're not able to make it up to Jackio's for a release, you're allowed to what we call seller your beer. So you have a portal on our website where when you get first crack at all of our releases before mm-hmm. those releases go public, we will reserve those beers for you. And if shipping's not an option, we only ask you to come up twice a year. Mm-hmm. So we do a mid-year, quote, seller clean out, and then we do an end-of-year clean out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think for people in West Virginia that are fairly close to Athens, like uh, Aaron and I are, coming up here is no big deal. You like to come up here anyway a oh, couple yeah. times a year. And it's, you yeah. can also, uh, like I am today, pick up my Imperial Scout bottles that oh, have yeah. come out earlier this year and clean out my locker. Yeah. Are yeah. you getting your Bewizzle Day bottles today? <laughs> well, yes. I am, I guess. Oh, yes. fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah then, it's uh, very convenient. When we do our, our mid-year cellar cleanouts, we... Usually do well. We always do that in June, and we circle it around uh, Be Whistle Day, which is <laughs> our uh, really tongue-in-cheek, uh, goofy barley wine release party. Oh, nice! Yeah. Whereas our anniversary party that we yeah. do every year is very yeah. kind of tight and stoic and celebratory. Sure, Be Whistle sure, Day sure. is like we're just, just we're just fun. having a good time. Yeah, yeah, just a lot of fun. I know that Be Whistle Day it won't be part of what this people that are listening to this podcast can get to because it probably won't come out until. Be whistled after. is af- past, but uh, uh, looking forward to a be whistled day. What are some of the highlights of that? Oh, th- this one, uh, this be whistled day, we're releasing a collab that I'm really, really excited about. Uh, if you've been drinking barrel aged barley wine for a long time, you probably know <gasps> about Mother of All Storms from Pelican Brewing Company. Oh, sure, sure. That's uh, a, a famous Pacific beer. Northwest at Legends. So, uh, Gentleman Scott Moore that worked for us for a while wound up moving to the Pacific Northwest and got a job at Pelican. Wound up running their barrel program. Wow! And Pelican yeah, rarely does collabs. Okay. They have but, friends. Uh, old, Scott old, old shared friends. some of our <laughs> some of our barrel aged barley wines with their brewmaster Darren, and said Scott, you can go brew a barley wine with them, which is a, a, an amazing feather feather in our cap. Yeah, to, looking forward to, be to able that. To do a barley wine collab with someone as highly lauded as Pelican. Yeah, mm-hmm. So that's Mother impressive. of All Bricks, a mashup of Mother of All Storms and, and Brick Kiln. What was the quantity you brewed or, or have bottled up for that? Oh, what well, we had eight barrels of that. We packaged seven. So that is a, a pretty, pretty limited run. Yeah. yeah so there, uh, you call the brewery if uh, you listen to this podcast. I want to see if there's any left. Uh, so yeah. You might yeah. Give them a call and see. It definitely. Yeah. Worth if you it. want to find out if bottles are available, you can go to what if you're in. West Virginia, you're probably closest to our tap room location. If you want to get bottles of any of our, of our releases, mm-hmm. uh, the tap room is the best place to do it. And you can either call or you can go to jackios.com, go right. to location, select tap room, and then click bottles, and it'll show you what bottles are available in the tap room. Ah, oh, perfect. I imagine some listeners are going to be excited about that. Um, you know, obviously Athens, Ohio makes a great little getaway up for folks in West Virginia, which we've discussed, especially for those who like a little, a little beercation, you know, so Jackie O's, I know previously last year, um, we talked about an Airbnb. Are there still Airbnbs available or what's the status of that? Yeah, there's an Airbnb out. We've got a 20 acre farm on the outskirts of town where we grow a lot of ingredients, mostly for the restaurant, but also for beer. We're yeah. about to harvest a bunch of red and golden beets uh, for a collab with our friends, our mutual friend brewing company out of Denver, Colorado. But out at the farm, we have an Airbnb which you can find through our website. Yeah. It's 
my friends and I rent it once a year and go out there and just stay at the farm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's beautiful. I was I was gonna kind of get into that next to talk about the Jack Hughes farm and For if sure. it's available still. Yeah, and have have you like added to the options there? I know that there was a lot of options as far as renting. You know, like as as a group or etc. If you want to come see the farm and have a tour or whatever you can do, um, is that still available and has it expanded? Uh, it hasn't expanded. It stayed very much the same. We saw a lot of uh, great support for that part of the program through COVID because people want to just go hang out in the woods. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah. a lovely Airb- Airbnb out on Barrel Ridge farm. Um, let's talk about the Jack Hughes bakery. Like yeah, for our the, listeners the that aren't Jack aware. Hughes bake shop, which is just down Campbell street from where we're sitting right now produces bread for a restaurant. Uh, there's also, uh, currently the retail operation at the bake shop is closed. However, what that means is that the baked goods are now available at the tap room. Oh, okay. Okay, so you do still have them here. You still produce them. Well, that's that's kind of different. I mean, that you can get all the baked goods right here in the yeah. tap room. Oh, yeah, it's great. There's yeah. a, there's baguettes and all kinds of stuff available in the tap room right now. I'll have to take a look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, also, again, when we last spoke to you, I know Art was part of our conversation, which, you know, he's not here today. Um, but he was very excited about a golf cart. He wanted a golf cart to be able to like <laughs> cruise up and down the street. So, um, did he ever get that golf cart? I'm just I haven't curious. Seen it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. We've talked about a lot of things. We've definitely discussed a lot of things today. But, but what what are some big plans for Jackie O's and yourself going forward? The biggest plan currently is to try to figure out what kind of brewery we want to be. Because for the longest time in our front of house spaces, we've been in Athens, Ohio, which when Ohio University is not in session, yeah. is about 22,000 people. Sure. Um, and we've done really well. The community support that we have both here, the brew pub and the public house is fantastic. But now we've opened up Jackie O's on 4th, which Columbus is about 1.2 million people. So our current plan is to figure out how to navigate. Yeah, and and to make sure that we don't make decisions that could affect us negatively in the wrong in the yeah. in the long run. Uh, the biggest thing personally is to figure out our brewing program up there, mm-hmm. uh, because when we bought the building, it was formerly Elevator Brewing Company's production brewery. Okay. Did you buy? So, did you buy that equipment? We weren't going to move it out yet. <laughs> Um, But that was Elevator's production brewery. So they had a 15-barrel brew house. They had 30-barrel fermenters. They had 60-barrel fermenters. And uh, the last thing that we need is another production brewery because we've spent 10 years carving out this uh, very, very nice production brewery. Thank you, Art. So what we're doing is we're uh, getting through probably the craziest summer that place is going to see into fall and then look at what worked in the program and then what didn't. So then off of that, well, because uh, I don't know if a 15-barrel brew house is the right size for that, if it's too big, if it's too small. Right, right. So we'll look at what worked in our portfolio and then size the brew house at the Columbus Brewery off of that. And then source all that equipment, set it all up, fix it, break it, fix it, break it, fix it, break it. <laughs> um, uh, so we've, we've got a couple months to figure out what's going to go on up there, but currently we're, we're very, very focused on making sure that we get the program in Columbus off the ground right. and doing well. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and trial and error, of course, is all about everything in a new area. Yeah. And, you know, not having to be rushed, it, it means a lot as far as a business goes. Yeah, it's the, the Jackie O's mantra. If it ain't broke, break it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Break it, fix it, break it, fix it, <laughs> as you previously said. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Well, before we close this podcast today, uh, Seth, I've got a list of beers here, and I was out checking before I came over here today to uh, the untapped list, and I, and I see untapped lists like 385 different beers, you know, since they've been around, <laughs> I guess, from like 2010 or 12 or whenever they opened untapped. Uh, but they, anyway, they've listed all these beers on there, and I went through the, some of the lists, and I just found uh, some of the more popular ones. But all, uh, the well, let's put it this way: the ones I liked and enjoyed, sure. uh, <laughs> and got through the years. And I just want maybe get your reaction, just a quick sentence or something about these different beers. And uh, first, I saw on there that was a lot of fun, and it was the Tank Dank series. 
Oh, yeah. That was, uh, so Tank Drank was a series of beers tank that we did. Tank Drank, I'm sorry. Oh, I said, no, it's okay. Dr- dank, tank, um, tank Drank. Tank Drank, yeah, there you but, go. But uh, pre-COVID, what we would do for our annual anniversary extravaganza, and mm-hmm. y'all were here, we would uh, yeah. shut down the entire brewery. we put up stanchions like at yeah. the bank, and everybody would weave through the brewery. We had multiple pouring stations for everybody. Uh, waiting in line to get their their bottles for the anniversary release. And we said, well, hey, that little tank's got wheels on it. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) what if we were to rack some barrel-aged beer onto some kooky adjuncts and literally set it up in line so that people could drink beer (laughs) off of the tank while they were waiting in line? And that was where the Tank Drank series came from. Uh, Yeah, that was cool. Now, uh, we've since filled that entire area with packaging equipment yeah. so even if we wanted to bring 500 people through the brewery for a release day you don't have the space we don't even have room yeah. it won't be happening again i hear you yeah hey nice to be around no, for it never the, say the, never the first charles. time around charles well that's okay yeah we've been putting we've been putting beer on kooky ingredients and in tanks for 17 years now don't ever wipe that off all right now let me think brings my mind though to another wonderful uh darker beer here uh the black maple series but you had a barrel uh, or a dumb excuse me a double barrel black maple yeah talk about that one just that a was bourbon barrel black maple that was in then aged in cinnamon vanilla whiskey barrels oh it was, it wow. was something else <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it sounds like it <laughs> That was uh, that's probably one that'll never happen again. We bought those barrels again, and then we put about four different beers in those barrels, allegedly from the same distiller, allegedly from the same <laughs> distributor. And after twelve months, they tasted like toothpaste and toilet bowl cleaner. Oh, that's uh, so I don't know if that was a bad run of those no. barrels, but I'm uh, yeah, I don't think I'm willing to, yeah. to gamble that much product on those again. But yeah. that double barrel black maple was something else. Yeah, yeah. it was. And, and and for listeners, uh, black maple is a, like an imperial porter, or what is it? Yeah, it's an imperial porter yeah. brewed with a little bit of smoked malt and a whole lot of maple syrup. There you go. And then one that uh, people are in. At, familiar with the Asheville market they'll know the burial brewery and uh there was a a beer that you guys brewed um which the name reminded me of a burial name and I'm gonna if I can get this out right is vision is lost without eyes to see through it yeah that that actually (laughs) that that wasn't a that wasn't a burial collab that was no I didn't think it was a collab yeah it's like the name reminded me of the burial that was to be honest I have no idea what barrels went into that that was a (laughs) that was a blend that was assembled by by Brad Clark before he left here yeah Ah, but uh one of one of the blends uh that we would call deep cut blends so when you brew a run of beer and you rack it into barrels, some barrels are ready when the majority's ready, and some aren't. Are not. Yeah. So what we do with those runs is we hang on to those barrels that aren't quite ready yet. So then, before the advent of the Imperial Scouts program, <laughs> those would get run into public blends. Sure, so sure. Vision is Lost wow. Without Eyes to See It Through was one of those public blends pre-Scouts. Yeah, I thought it was a standout, as I recall. So good. Uh, and a, a little more recent one, I think, that you may have had a hand in, and hopefully you did here, the Illust Vanillins. Illust Vanillins, yeah. That was a collaboration, uh, well, with our, our blending team, which mm-hmm. is about four people. And uh, that was a name that was come up with by our former wood cellar manager, Tom Leatherman. Okay. Oh, nice. uh, if anybody's into hip hop, if anyone listens to MF Doom, <laughs> the illest villains. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was uh, that was an MF Doom rep. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Another one that I liked, and it's slightly it's still a dark beer, but a little different one was the the Champion Ground series. Yeah. yeah. Talk a little bit about Champion Ground because those are probably still be coming out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you this because it passed lab and we ordered labels, and this is what time frame this podcast is coming out on. <laughs> so, uh, yes, new for beer. For those that have listened this far into the episode, you're rewarded with knowing that <laughs> Champion Ground will be being released during Ohio Brew Week. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's very cool. No, that's wild. Yeah, I imagine people will be excited about that. I think another beer that made you guys famous has been this uh, Oro Negro. Yeah. Uh, talk about Oro Negro for people that haven't had the pleasure of, of drinking that beer, and I know there's variants of that, too. Yeah, so Oro Negro came about, and Oro was conceived by our then-pub brewer, 
Clark Benson, a dear friend of mine who's now at Masthead Brewing up in Cleveland. Nice. Uh, this was when those Mexican chocolate cake stouts yeah, were like yeah. Westbrook was crushing, Abraxas was, yeah. was on its ascent. Yeah. Right. Uh, so Clark took a page out of that book and did a half barrel or 15 gallon treatment keg on oil of Aphrodite. Oh, wow. And created Oro Negro. From then, it hit draft. People freaked out. Yeah. We scaled it to production. <laughs> and that's one that we, we still produce every year. Oh, very cool. And you're also uh, adept at your fruit fruited sours. Yeah. And that's something that's really been a standout here. And these are not the quick sours that people, a lot of brewers make today. These are the true, true aged uh, mm -hmm. sour beers. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm just going to name, throw out a couple of names. You can tell me uh, a little, anything you want to say about them. Evelyn uh, was one of my favorites. Uh, Dynamo Hum has been a, a favorite. Maybe that's a little different beer. A Hound's Tooth, I think, might be a Dynamo yeah. Hum variant. Any, any of those kind of, you know, even Tart the Cherry. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, just beers like that. I mean, talk about your inspirations here for making these uh, sour, fruited sours. Well, that's we were one of the... I almost messed up, but we were in the United <laughs> States, one of the uh, one of the early adopters, you know, third wave craft of doing barrel aged mixed fermentation beer. Yeah, I almost said that we were one of the earliest producers oh, yeah. of <laughs> fruited mixed fermentation beer. Hey, hey we're not going to judge you that and much. The it's Belgian cool. Navy was about to sail up the Hocking with torches and pitchforks. Yeah, that's, they fair, were. that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. But uh, er early, early on in Jackie O's history, uh, Brad was experimenting with mixed fermentation beers and, and fruited beers. And it's something that while we're not making as much fruited sour as we are, say, Mystic, which would also be entirely impossible, if there are products that are, are it's a, a line in our portfolio that is so important to us. And it's a way to connect with the land. A lot of times we'll be using local fruit and working yeah. with local producers. And now that our mixed fermentation program is getting a lot more steam behind it, uh, something that we will be producing a lot more of in the future. That's exciting. And I know uh, maybe this one uh, predates you leading the brewing any, uh, operations anyway, but uh, it's, it's a, a beer that I remember from a while back, uh, your barley wine brick, brick kiln, but it was the rum barrel aged uh, brick kiln. Yeah, rum barrel brick kiln was awesome. <laughs> rum barrels are uh, very finicky to work with. You know, think of the, the journey of a barrel from it leaving Kentucky and then coming to Ohio versus a barrel leaving Barbados and coming to Ohio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they have to go through customs. Oh, Maybe yeah. they're sitting in a customs yard in the sun because a big thing of value to us is that the barrels, because if you leave a barrel empty, it you know, the wood will oh, warp. Oh, yeah, warp. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So we found a source of domestic U.S.-based rum barrels that we've put out some really, really nice rum barrel projects with, and rum barrel brick kiln being one of those. Uh, the beer that we're drinking right now, Double Barrel Temple of Minerva, these barrels, that, so they age for about a year, actually more like 16 months in American bourbon whiskey casks. Nice. And then we transferred them into casks that originally held bourbon, then went to the Caribbean, held Caribbean rum, then came back to the States and were used to finish bourbon. So if you see stuff like Jefferson's will do it a lot where oh, it's like a wow. uh, cask yeah. finish. Right, right. So we got our mitts on these because there is a difference between the domestic rum barrel character and the Caribbean rum barrel character. Okay. You can't really fake that Caribbean rum character. However, the barrels are very, very problematic. Uh, you know, in that time that they're coming through a customs yard or they're sitting in quarantine... From yeah, what that I understand, what you're used for. when barrels are imported, a lot of times through our southern border, they have to ship without a bung. They have to ship open. Oh, yeah. Which or else they everything. would be full of. Right, yeah. 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 So it's when those barrels sit out in the sun, there's a lot of room for beer spoilage organisms to make, sure, it, to make yeah. it in there. I imagine. So yeah. it's, it's really hard to get good Caribbean rum character yeah. into beer. But with the barrels that we used on Double Barrel Temple, since they then came back to the States and yeah. held bourbon whiskey, bourbon whiskey will... Kill it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Kill we'll it all. Microbially stabilize the barrel. <laughs> um, so, yeah. so true. So anytime we have an opportunity to get 
good rum character out yeah. of the barrel. Yeah, and that, yeah. that's been a fantastic beer. Yeah, and Thank uh, you. Before we wrap this up, I got one final beer here that I just want to say uh, yeah. thank you for continuing making this beer. And this was one that uh, our friend Kelly Sauber here in Athens, who's not only a, a brewer, but he's a cider maker now and a distiller here yeah. in the area. Uh, the pawpaw ale, pawpaw wheat, made yeah. every every fall. He originated that beer. You guys have picked it up. I want you to tell me a little bit of what you what's going on with that. Yeah, pawpaw wheat is such a fun beer, and we're uh, we're privileged to be able to to you know hold the torch and to be able to produce that beer annually. Pawpaw fruit is very culturally important to us. Oh, of course, yeah. And it's it's a bit of a bear of a beer to make. Oh, it's got a, uh, yeah. For those that know mash bills, the mash bill is about 50% wheat, so yeah. loudering is pretty difficult. And then uh, and the pawpaw com- puree is is a little difficult to work it's with. It's a process. Yeah. And, but we think, it's, we think it's worth the work. And it comes out pretty high ABV, too. Yeah, that was just the, the way that it came to us, that it yeah. was a 9% fruited yeah. wheat beer. It's, yeah. not, it's no lightweight in the fruit beers. Yeah, so. yeah which, yeah, It'll that, catch that, that is guard. not your typical fruit beer ABV. Like, generally, it's much lower. So, yeah. yeah, half. Yeah. But, but, it, <laughs> but it is one that uh, the, the fruits are native fruits to the area yeah. here, the Appalachian area. I think uh, Integration Acres probably yeah. uh, may raise all the pawpaws here. Yeah. Or at least they process the pawpaws. To, You're correct. That's very and, uh, cool. Anyway, it's just great to see that. And, and among fruit beers, it's wonderful to have a pawpaw uh, wheat ale. Yeah. Uh, anything else, uh, Aaron, before we wrap up? Uh, no, nothing other than this has just been phenomenal phenomenal we've we've thoroughly enjoyed chatting with you and looking forward to what jackie o's does going forward and support you and your efforts that are ongoing now as far as expansion and other other places that you're trying to keep up the beer making for so can't wait to talk to you (laughs) you about it Yeah, yeah looking forward to coming back in in a while and Touch and base. You know where to find me. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I think we'll head down to the tap room after this and maybe have another beer. Yeah. Guys. That sounds like a good idea. Thank I, you all so much for having me on. This uh, has been right. lovely. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Seth. We, yeah. we very much appreciate it. And Jackie O's, we hope you do well. This brings us to the close of another podcast. Remember, you can subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast host. Thank you for listening to West Virginia Beer Roads. West Virginia Beer Roads is a production of BrilliantStream.com.